Let's see if we're going to find out who was renting it. You guys all ready for a trolley ride? Yeah! yeah. yeah. Ready. Glad to hear that. Well, here we go. By the way, just in case, just for your information, this is a 75 minute historical tour around the town of Hershey. Um, if you were looking for the summer trolley adventure, that ended on Memorial Day. The summer trolley adventure is two young people standing up front here, putting on a little show, singing songs, recreating characters from the town's past. It's only 45 minutes long. There's lots of excitement. Kids like it. And uh, this is not that ride. Sometimes, sometimes I get out there, I'm halfway done with my tour, and, some, and, and, and somebody says, what happened to the kids? Where are they at? We like that. So, uh, kids, if your parents say you're riding this, the last chance to get off, if you're looking for that ride, if you're going to stay on the trolley, the kids, the only consolation I have for you is that this, this, year's, this year's trolley, you get a lot more candy. Okay? The other thing I'd like to tell you, say to you is uh, if you have cell phones, please silence them now. Don't have them ringing while we're out here. I've got a lot, I've got a lot of information to give you. And if you're quiet, if you're quiet, I've got candy to give you. But you have to be quiet. Um, if you have cell phones, silence them. If you get a phone call, I'd ask you to wait till we get back to uh, talk a little. Like I said, you know how it is when you're trying to hear somebody talk and there's other conversations going on all around, all around you, so it can be frustrating. So I just ask for the convenience and the, the enjoyment of everybody on the trolley uh, to keep conversations at a minimum, okay? Or if you have to talk, just keep it brief and keep your voices down. Please don't disturb uh, the other guests around you, and particularly don't disturb me. I'm disturbed enough as it is already. So. All that being said, the only other requirement that I have of all of you is to have fun. You ready to have fun? Yeah. Great. I want to officially welcome all of you to Hershey Trolley Works Trolley Car Number Six, and welcome to the sweetest place on earth, Hershey, Pennsylvania. We're going to take you for a little ride around town, show you a lot of the important buildings here in town. As, I, as we get started, I want to learn just a little bit about you, so I've got a few questions to ask you all. And if I ask a question and it pertains to you, put your hand up in the air. Participate, okay? Don't sit like a bump on the bench. So here's the first question. Who on this trolley likes chocolate? Put your hand up if you like chocolate. Real high, get them up there. Great, put them down, that's a lot of hands. How about if you love chocolate? You love chocolate, both hands, both hands way up in the air. Come on, stretch, try to touch the ceiling. Wow, any chocolate on the trolley. I'm right there with you, brothers and sisters. All of you chocolate lovers, would the world's largest chocolate factory be of interest to you? That's the first thing we're going to do. Go to the west side of town. We're going to see the West Hershey plant for the Hershey Company. It's the Hershey Company's flagship factory. 94% of the chocolate the Hershey Company makes is made right out here on the west side of town. And it is the world's largest chocolate factory. After we see that, we're going to go downtown. We're going to see the site of Mr. Hershey's original chocolate factory. Mr. Hershey started building the chocolate factory and the town back in 1903. Started making chocolate in 1905. By 1915, this chocolate factory was the largest chocolate factory in the world. And it remained that for 97 years till the spring of 2012 when they moved all the production to the new factory. Now we'll see a lot of other important buildings as we go around town and while we do all this sightseeing I'm going to be telling you stories. You guys like stories? Yeah. My stories are really good. They're all about chocolate. And the man behind the Great American Chocolate Bar, his name was Milton S. Hershey. And I'm also going to tell you a lot about the Milton Hershey School. Anyone heard of the Milton Hershey School? A number of you have. The Milton Hershey School is a residential school that's for children from families in financial need. Mr. Hershey and his wife started that school back in 1909, and today it is the heart of the Hershey community. So my only other question for all of you is, is anybody on the trolley from Hershey? Okay, now listen. I've got a lot of great stories for these folks, okay? Most of them are true. So just let that be your guide, okay? It can get a little dicey when there's Hershey people on the trolley. Our motor man today is motor man George. Everybody say, say hi, motor man George. Hi, I'm your motor mouth. My name's Kim. George and I invite you all to sit back now and relax, travel around Chocolate Town with us on this trolley. 
Hershey, Pennsylvania, that was your destination, right? That's what you plugged into the GPS. Hershey's situated in the Lebanon Valley. It's bordered to the south by the Cornwall Iron Hills. To the north where the skyline meets the tree line, there's a dark blue line out there. That's the Blue Mountain. Blue Mountain is part of the Appalachians. Original European settlers in this valley, they were Scottish-Irish. They came here from Derry or London, Derry, Ireland. Settled here around 1714. In 1724, they founded a church not too far from here, the Derry Presbyterian Church. And a little village grew up around that church. It included a post office, a tavern, a little stone schoolhouse, and they called that village Derry Church. And that's where we get our name for where we are today. You see, Hershey was never incorporated. Officially, there's not a town called Hershey. We get on the map of Hershey because the post office is the Hershey Post Office. You're actually in Derry Township. Derry Township covers 24 square miles with 24,000 residents. By the middle of the 1830s, Milton Hershey would own over 50 dairy farms here in this township. He'd actually end up owning two-thirds of those 24 square miles. And starting in 1929, places he had dairy farms, he started building large homes for the boys coming to his industrial school. The Hershey Industrial School, a trade school for orphan boys. Here's the Dairy Township Municipal Offices. It's on the site of one of Mr. Hershey's old farms. They incorporated some of the buildings from the farm into the office complex. The barn from the farm is that big yellow building right there. That big brick building with the dormers is an early student home. The boys that lived in that house put milk cows in the barn. And you can still read their names on the beams of the barn, their initials and their names. It's over here to the left side of the trolley. This is the entrance to the West Hershey Chocolate Factory. Border on both sides by Hershey Kiss Bushes because when the factory was initially built back in 1993, it was built to make molded and filled Hershey Kisses. In a few moments, Motorman George is going to drive down Old Chocolate Avenue right past the factory. And, and I'll tell you all about it once we get over there. But on our way, this is not your first opportunity to get a good look at the world's largest, most technologically advanced factory for the making of milk chocolate candy. Now, as the Revolutionary War approached, those Scots Irish settlers that came here in the early 1700s, they were migrating west, seeking opportunity along the frontier. In behind them came people from southwestern Germany and Switzerland, an area that was san that sandwiched between those two countries called the Palatinate. The folks that came from that area, they were mostly dairy farmers, and they started to settle in this area so that by the middle of the 1800s, all around us here, this was Pennsylvania Dutch dairy country. That's what we call these folks today, the Pennsylvania Dutch. Cornfields and cows, lots of cows. Milton Hershey was born on a Pennsylvania Dutch dairy farm, not very far from here, way back in 1857 BC. Oh, B.C. You know what that stands for in this case, right? Before a chocolate. That farm was started by his great-grandfather, Isaac Hershey, back in 1796, and then passed down through the family, father to son, until it came to Milton Hershey's parents, Henry Hershey, and his mother, Veronica Buckwalter Snavely Hershey. That's a mouthful, isn't it? That's why everybody just called her Fanny. Henry and Fanny, they had one other child. They had a little girl. Her name was Serena. But Serena passed away when she was just five years old from scarlet fever. She was Milton Hershey's only sibling, and that was his immediate family, Henry, Fanny, and Serena. And his parents, Henry and Fanny, they were two very different personalities. Fanny was the daughter of a successful Lancaster County farming family, the Snavely family. She was a plain Mennonite lady. Now, plain means she dressed plain. She wore a long black dress, black bonnet, a white apron, and she had that uh, Pennsylvania Dutch farm family work ethic. You know, you get up real early in the morning before the sun comes up, work hard all day long, and you go to bed early with a sense of accomplishment. His father Henry, on the other hand, well, Henry was a different sort of a bird. Henry considered himself a bit of an intellectual. His nose was usually in a, oh, he always dressed in a very dapper fashion. For one thing, he wore a bow tie, a fedora hat, he carried a cane with a gold cap. His nose was often in a book, and when he wasn't reading, his head was up here in the clouds. He wanted to see all those things he was reading about. An adventurer, an explorer, an inventor, an entrepreneur. And you're going to discover that Milton Hershey was a combination of those qualities. He had this curiosity and the sense of dreaming and big like his father Henry. He had the work ethic, the, the industry, the stick to it of this to get the job done like his mother Dan. Over here, this is the Penn State Hershey Rehabil Rehabilitation Hospital, part of the Penn State Health Network. Uh, College of Medicine for Penn State's over there about a mile. You're operating on the medical center over there and you need time to get back on your feet. You come there for rehab. But did you see the outpatient center there that you went by? That second floor above the outpatient center, that's for chocolate 
rehabilitation. Yeah. <laughs> you can imagine a town called Hershey, a chocolate town, there'd be a few people with an issue, right? Henry Hershey took the family away from the farm, went off chasing his dreams. He had a lot of great ideas. What he lacked was the tenacity to make his dreams a reality. So he never made the family much money. And as a consequence, he had uh, Milton Hershey, young Milton Hershey, had a poor, unstable childhood. He lived in 17 different places as he grew up. He attended seven different schools by the time he was 14 years old. And Milton Hershey never had much more than a fourth or fifth grade in formal education. But at that point, he dropped out of school and went right to work. One year later, the year he turned 15 years old, his mother Fanny made a decision for him that affected the rest of his life and all of our lives too. And I'll tell you what that was in a couple minutes, but right now we're passing the West Hershey plant. The reason this factory is built out here is because the original factory downtown started making chocolate in 1905. The demand for that chocolate was so great that every couple to three years, sales doubled, and they kept expanding the factory and adding on to it. By the 1940s, the old chocolate factory downtown was 42 buildings all under one roof. 2.2 million square feet of floor space that occupied 20 acres. By the 1970s, the old factory was showing its age, and by the 1990s, when the Hershey Company wanted to expand on the Hershey Kiss product line, they looked at the old building downtown, they said, this new equipment's not going to fit in this old factory without spending a lot of extra money to refurbish it. It would be wiser to build a new factory. And that's what they did. The part out here that has the blue stripe around it, that opened in 1993 to make molded and filled Hershey Kisses. If you rode the free ride at Chocolate World, you saw them extruding kisses on a big wide conveyor belt. Here at this factory, they pour the chocolate into molds. They combine the uh, different kinds of chocolate that way and add various ingredients to the candies. Between the years 2010 and 2012, they expanded the factory back that direction. When that expansion was complete, they had doubled the size of this factory to nearly 700,000 square feet. Moved all the production from the old factory downtown here, and all the chocolate we make here in town today is made there. The old factory is retired. 1,100 chocolate workers work in there. Their jobs are fairly technical. Nobody touches the ingredients of the product. They put on white aprons, white bonnets, walk down through a tunnel where jets of air blow anything off of them they don't want to carry into their workstation. And then they work on computers and, and control the equipment in there that does all the heavy lifting. In a few minutes, I'll tell you how much chocolate they make in there. But we, we've been talking a lot about history, haven't we? Let's change the subject a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about what I like to call Hershey history. The very first Hershey Kiss, Kiss was introduced in the old chocolate factory downtown way back in 1907. Kids, in 1907, you could buy a Hershey Kiss for just one penny. They wanted a little piece of chocolate that a child could afford. And when they licensed that name Hershey Kiss, they also licensed the name Hershey Hug. They figured if you had a kiss, you had to have a hug to go along with it. I always like hugs with my kisses. How about you? Yeah, yeah, she does. Yeah, sure. Who goes without saying? Only thing is, nobody knew what a hug was going to be. It wasn't until the 1980s that someone came up with the idea of taking an almond and sticking it in a Hershey kiss. They briefly considered that to be a hug, but if you look at a, an almond kiss and a regular kiss side by side, well, they look exactly alike. There was no glamour in that. Now, about the same time, an engineer came up with the idea of taking a little milk chocolate kiss and robing it in white chocolate and putting a swirl of milk chocolate around that. They thought, fine, and we've got ourselves a hug. That's the kind of kisses that West Hershey was built to make, and that's the kind of kisses I have right here in this basket. Now, let me hang on to your light while we make this turn. And, uh, and what we do on the trolley with these baskets of candy, we take the baskets, pass them back one side, across the back, and then up to the front. That's the most expeditious way to get the candy around the trolley. When this, trolley, when this basket comes to you, take one or two of them and pass them on. Does anybody know what the tag on top of a little uh, Hershey Kiss is called? That little tag there. Yes, ma'am. What is it? Looks like you're gonna say a P word, right? Are you gonna say plume? Is that the word you're looking for, plume? Yeah, that's your right. That's exactly what it's called. It's called a plume. And the plume tells you what kind of kiss it is. So this one here, that says hugs on it. The silver ones with the stripes. The purple ones say hug or uh, dark chalk dark on them. That's a dark chocolate kiss. And the blue ones are my favorites. These ones, these ones here say cookies on them. The blue ones are cookies and cream kisses. Makes my mouth water just saying them. It makes me think of Christmas time. Chocolate with cookies and milk. So, so what we're gonna do? We're gonna start here. Pass them on. Take a couple. Pass them on. 
And uh, would you please be kind to Motor Man George? Hang on to your wrappers to left our, our police around your sit where you're sitting a little bit. We have a waste basket up here where you can dispose of the litter after you exit the trolley. Now, um, did you know there was another candy maker here in town besides Mr. Hershey? In 1917, 1917, a fellow came to town. He was a dairyman by trade, but as a young man, places he lived, he tried to start little candy businesses. Kept failing until he came here. Got a job at Hershey Chocolate Company, first as a dairyman, then he worked in the factory, and Harry Burnett Reese and Milton Hershey became good friends. And Milton Hershey inspired Harry to try making candy again. In 1928, he came up with the idea of peanut butter covered with chocolate, and that was so successful, he out through two factories and his family built this one right here in 1957. This is the Reese factory. Today it's a Hershey company, but uh, uh, today it's a state-of-the-art facility, just like West Hershey. All the ingredients come in one end of the building and out the other end every day with the help of 600 chocolate workers, come five million full-size wrapped and bagged peanut butter cups. Who likes peanut butter cups? How about those little miniature ones? The ones you unwrap and pop in your mouth when both lines are operating simultaneously over here? They can make 9,000 of those a minute. They also make Kit Kat bars. All together, they make 2 million pounds of candy a day at the Reese Bank. At the West Hershey plant right here, every day, 340,000 gallons of fresh milk come to this factory from farms within a, a 90 mile radius to make milk chocolate. And every day over here at the West Hershey plant, they make upwards of 80 million Hershey Kiss products. That's over 3 million Hershey Kisses an hour, 50,000 Hershey Kisses a minute, 900 Hershey Kisses a second, a lot of kissing going on in that bag. They make 4 million chocolate bars a day, chocolate bars with almonds, symphony bars, Rolo caramels, chocolate syrup. 3 million pounds of chocolate and chocolate candy every day at West Hershey. 2 million pounds of candy a day at the Reese factory. Now do you understand why we call this the sweetest place on earth, chocolate town? No, Brian, just back. Anybody sign up for the, uh, the, the chocolate tasting experience today? Have you done it yet? Got your certificate, right? Well, I suggest you take your certificate over there and see if you can get a job. Because that's the technical center for the Hershey Company. And, and that's where they develop their new products. And that's where they hire people whose job it is is to taste chocolate. They call them palateers. And he got he, he sat in the class and he got a certificate that says Hershey Palateer on it. So I always tell my guests, try it out, see if you go to get your job. I haven't heard anybody get you one love yet. That why not try? Even if it's for a day, that would be great to be able to say, I was a chocolate taster for the Hershey Company. Well, uh, the 19... It, it, uh, let's see, what year was it? When Milton Hershey was 15 years old, his mother Fanny apprenticed him to a local candy maker down in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a man named Joseph Royer. And the Royer's ice cream parlor and garden, Milton Hershey learned how to make all the good stuff. Cakes and pies, roasted nuts, ice cream, sugar candy, parables. Does that sound good to you? Yeah? I've always said that's a job a 15-year-old boy can really sink his teeth into. And that's where his lifelong love for candy began. Four years later, at the age of 19 years old, he decided it was time for him to start his own candy business. He chose Philadelphia, Pennsylvania as the place to get his start. The year was 1876. That date ought to sound familiar to most of us. That's the year our country was celebrating its 100th birthday. And in Philadelphia, to celebrate, they were holding a big Centennial World's Fair. It's estimated that one out of every four Americans visited the World's Fair in Philadelphia. And young Milton figured if he got his start down there, he couldn't fail. Well, he was right. He did great at first. But after the party was over and all the crowds went home, times turned tough. He had high sugar bills, sales didn't keep up with the cost of his sugar, and although he worked at it for six years, he worked hard too. Towards the end of those six years, he worked himself sick. But in 1882, he went bankrupt in Philadelphia and had to close his door. His first bankruptcy, not his last one. Went on to his family in Lancaster, where he got a letter from his father, Henry. Remember Henry the Adventurer? In 1882, Henry was out in Colorado. And uh, he observed that there was a lot of money being made by silver prospectors. He, he wrote to Milton, he says, join me out here, son, let's strike the bricks together. Milton packed his bags, headed out to Colorado. He got out there, you know what he found? He found most of the silver had been discovered. He didn't spend one day digging for silver. He went to work for a candy maker in Denver, Colorado, and that candy maker shared some knowledge with him. The knowledge was how to make his caramels 
softer, chewier, tastier, and able to stay fresh longer on the shelf by adding fresh milk to the caramels. Rather than the paraffin wax, Mr. Royer taught him to put in his caramels to make them chewy. See around here, that's what most candy makers did. They put wax in the caramels to give them a chew. What would you rather have, wax caramels or milk caramels? Sort of called no-brainer, right? He took that knowledge and headed off to Chicago, then down to New Orleans. Finally, in 1884, he went up to New York City. He figured he could make it there, he could make it anywhere. But by 1886, he was bankrupt for the second time. Now, 10 years had gone by, it was 1886. He had four failures, two of them had been bankruptcies. He was 29 years old and all he had to show for 10 years of effort was enough money to buy a train ticket to get home to his family in Lancaster. When he went home to Lancaster, the only family member who would talk to him, the only person who, who didn't want to see his shadow dark with her door because he borrowed so much money from him, was his mother's sister, Martha. He called her Aunt Maddie. And he went to his Aunt Maddie, and he, excuse me, I'm sorry, and he said something like this. He said, um, he said, Aunt Maddie, would you, would you mortgage your home and loan me the money to start another candy business? No. Before you answer, she was a big Milton supporter. And, and she did that. She mortgaged her home for $700 and gave him the money. And he started what he called the Lancaster Carmel Company. And finally, after all of this time, this one didn't do very good either. In fact, they were with just days within the bank coming in for closing on Aunt Maddie's mortgage, taking her home and everything they own. I'll tell you what happened a few minutes right now. Look out here. This is Chocolate Avenue we're on right now. Now, what would you expect to find lining a street called Chocolate Avenue in a town called Hershey? Look out the windows and up. You see some of our famous Hershey Kiss street lights out here. 128 of these street lights line Chocolate Avenue. They alternate between wrapped and unwrapped Hershey Kisses. They're the only giant kisses that Hershey makes. They're made out of white chocolate. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Everyone else is either sleeping or chewing chocolate. That's right. Over on our left, that's the Hershey Story Museum. The Museum of Chocolate Avenue, we call it. Great museum, about $12.95, but you could spend, easily spend two or three hours in there. Then beyond that is the Hershey Press Building. That's where they made wrappers for the chocolate that was being made at the factory just down the street. Now here we are at the main intersection of town. We're at the intersection of chocolate and cocoa, and we're turning on to Cocoa Avenue right now. And if you look out here to the left front of the trolley, you'll see a gray limestone building down the street. That's the original chocolate factory. We'll see it again later. Look at this big building on our left. <clears throat> see this big building with that red tile roof? That's the community building that Mr. Hershey built for the people in his town. It's built out of limestone. Six and a half acres of floor space inside this building. When this building opened, it opened up a swimming pool inside, basketball and tennis courts, billiard rooms, residential rooms for men. With six and a half acres of floor space in there, in the basement they had a bowling alley and the golf driving range. It was like a glorified YMCA. Two theaters also. We still use one of those theaters. Here comes the entrance and marquee for our beautiful Broadway-style Hershey Theater. When it, it's a 1904 C theater. When it opened in 1933, they put just about the whole township in there. It opened with vaudeville shows. A vaudeville show was like a variety show, performed live on stage in front of you. Pretty soon band concerts. And then Broadway shows would come to the theater. Still today, if a Broadway show goes on a national tour, it'll eventually make its way to the Hershey Theater. The theater and the community building, they're styled after the architecture of Venice, Italy. It's beautiful inside there. But of all the things I told you about the, uh, the, the community building, the most important thing for you to remember is it went, on, it went under construction at the beginning of 1929. What happened in 1929, folks? <coughs> the stock market crashed. That's right. Banks were failing. Businesses were going under. Business, businesses were businessmen were circling the wagons. They were, they were going on the defense. Not Mr. Hershey. Mr. Hershey went on offense. He used his own money and went on a building campaign to make work for people in the area. And the community building, that was the first of seven major building projects completed during the, during the uh, Great Depression. And I'll show you more as we go along. Over here to the right side of the trolley, that building over there is the Consolidated School. Don't know if you have 
that that gave a $50 million, I think it was, to the town to build this. And, um, and uh, they consolidated 17 little one-room schoolhouses into a good good uh, consolidated school here for the boys and girls in the community by, by 1915. In 1925, by that time, they'd expanded and added on a wing so the boys and girls could receive vocational training. These houses that are coming up on either side of the trolley, these homes were built for his workers. They were built around 1910 for $1,100 a piece. Now to do all this building, he had a construction company. It was called the Hershey Improvement Company. And he used that company to put in the infrastructure so the people in this community would have homes with inside plumbing, running water, electricity. And then he built them homes and he sold them those homes for whatever it cost to build them. His workers bought those homes for $1,100. Here on Job Avenue, on our right, as we go down Job here, you'll see some uh, uh, Mediterranean-style duplex homes. They were built for his mid-level managers. They got the same deal. Remember, they had inside plumbing, running water, and electricity? At that time in our country's history, only about eight homes out of every hundred nationwide had electricity in them. Most of us wouldn't have had that in our home. And this was rural Pennsylvania. This was Pennsylvania farm country. I'll guarantee you how many homes had inside plumbing or running water. Sons and daughters of the Pennsylvania Dutch farmers were coming over to the chocolate factory, getting good paying jobs, uh, with, uh, and, and then having luxury homes made available to them at a cost within reach. Single family, double family homes on wide, tree-lined, landscape, paved streets. They highly regarded their employer, Hilton Hershey. Now over here to the right front of the trolley on his map of the town, when he came back here in 1900, he had set aside one square mile that he donated to the town to be used for the future educational, recreational, and cultural facilities for the community. So as we go up Homestead Road here, once we make our turn, uh, these are the our, our, our modern day Gary Township schools, the public schools. They're consolidated, they're all in a row. We call them the Hershey School. Hershey Elementary, Hershey Middle School, Hershey High School. On the far side of the property along Coco Avenue, that's the rec center for Derry Township. And in between are the athletic fields for the schools. And the public school kids here, their mascot is the Trojan, or the Hershey Trojans. In a moment, we'll begin the campus of the Hilton Hershey School on our left, where the soybean field starts up here. When we get up here, this, this is the campus of the Milton Hershey School. And the Milton Hershey School kids, they're the Milton Hershey Spartans. So we got Spartans over here on our left, Trojans over here on our right. We have a nice little rival over here in town. Starts off every autumn with a football game at Hershey Park Stadium, and they call that football game the Coco Bean Bowl. Coco Bean Bowl. Days before the bank was coming to foreclose on Aunt Maddie's mortgage, Mr. Hershey caught a break. There was an Englishman over here visiting. This Englishman represented a candy company back there across the pond, and he heard about these soft, tasty caramels that would stay fresh on the boat ride back over there. He'd been scouring the countryside trying to find something like these unsuccessfully because around here, what do most candy makers put in the caramels to make them chewy? Wax, that's great. This Mr. Hershey was in a park in Lancaster pushing a push cart, selling his caramels off the cart. This, this fellow approached him, tried one of his caramels, and got all excited. He said, these are wonderful. They taste so good, and they're so soft and fresh. What do you put in these that make them like this? What did Mr. Hershey tell him? Yes. Milk chocolate milk, right? No. Nothing. You're right. He said, I'm sorry, sir. I can't tell you what I put in them, but I'll sell you all that you want. Well, this gentleman placed an order for Milton Hershey's Crystal A caramels. That single order was so large, it would take him out of 10 years of debt. All of his creditors, creditors got paid back, Aunt Maddie got her money back, but then more orders for large quantities of caramels kept coming in. And within four years of being flat broke up in New York City, Milton Hershey was listed on the 1890 census in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, as one of the wealthiest men in town. And he did that making what kind of candy? This is your opportunity to make some noise. When I go like this, it means I just shared some knowledge with you and you're supposed to repeat that answer back to me. So what was Mr. Hershey's first candy making success? Oh. Good job. Those caramels were selling great over in England. You know what he found out in England? Um, I'm sorry, England's that way. In England, that uh, uh, he found out that they were taking his caramels and were coating them with something wonderful. What do you think it was? Chocolate. What kind of chocolate? Dark chocolate. 
higher in cocoa content, more expensive to make. Go back over there in England, ordinary folks would be hard pressed to come up with the price of, piece of a piece of dark chocolate. But if they took his inexpensive imported caramels, put a little coating of dark chocolate on them, ordinary folks could enjoy it. Just the kind of thing that would appeal to this version. 1893, he purchased the equipment to begin making his own chocolate candy. Set it up. Uh, set that equipment up in the east side of his caramel factory in Lancaster, and in 1894 he started making his own chocolate. Dozens of different shapes. He gave those candies all kinds of fancy names to make them appealing to people. He was coating his caramels with chocolate. But the only kind of chocolate he could make at that time was that dark European style chocolate. But in 1894 there were now two candy companies in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, incorporated that year. The Lancaster Caramel Company, making Crystal A Caramels, the candy that made him his first fortune, and now a brand new candy company, the Hershey Chocolate Company, making dark chocolate candy, baking chocolate, and cocoa products. Time for more chocolate. Let's celebrate all that success with these. This is These are caramel-filled kisses. Everybody take one and pass them on. Make sure everybody gets one. Right now, we're on the main campus of the Milton Hershey School. Look out here to the left front of the, camp, of, of the trolley. You should be able to see a big white stone building over there. That's called Founders Hall. It's a memorial built to honor the founders of the school, Milton and his wife. I'll introduce you to her in a moment. There to our left is a big red brick building. That's the, uh, the, the uh, infirmary for the school. It's a 200-bed health center. They need a big health center here on campus because there's 2,100 2, children who come here and call this home. They can go home three to six weeks during the summertime, five weekends during the school year, the rest of the time they're on campus. Uh, elementary school for the school is over here down this lane, Fannie B. Hershey Memorial Elementary School. It's for four-year-olds through fourth graders on the far side of the campus, up on top of, uh, not campus, but on the far side of town by Chocolate World, up on top of the hill that says, Welcome to Hershey. You remember seeing that big castle up there? That's the middle school for fifth graders to eighth graders. And then back over here, this is the high school campus. This is called Spartan Commons for ninth through 11, 12th grade, ninth through 12th graders. It's, Spartan Commons is huge. All the school buildings are really big because classroom sizes are really small. No more than 15 to 16 kids per classroom, and most classes are smaller than that. And here at Spartan Commons, besides classrooms for academics, there's classrooms for vocational training as well. Besides the school buildings and the infirmary, there's an agricultural and environmental education center, there's an alumni campus, there's about 190 student homes on the campus, and then we have Founders Hall right here, which besides being a memorial to the Hershey's, is also the school's administrative center. Before I tell you why this school is here, let, let's uh, get Mr. Hershey uh, married off, okay? So in 1894, he's a very wealthy man, and and and, uh, and, and he's acquiring a reputation because his caramels are being sold not only here in this country but all around the world, even in China. And he's acquiring a reputation as the king of caramel. And just like his father liked to travel, so did he. He was traveling all over the world, seeing new sights, learning new things. Over in Europe, he, he learned about how they were making sweet milk chocolate over there. Tried it out, thought it was pretty good, put that idea under his hat. Came back here to this country. In 1896, he took a sales trip up into New York State. Walked into a candy store in Jamestown, New York. And across the room of that store, he saw the most beautiful young woman he had seen on any of his travels. Turned out her name was Catherine Elizabeth Sweeney. Catherine Sweeney was born up in Jamestown in 1871. And in 1896, at the age of 25 years old, she was a beautiful, auburn-haired, Irish Catholic lass. He saw her across the room, their eyes met, fellas, he was a goner from the start. His knees went a little weak. I'd walk back there to you. Yeah, you. I'd walk back there to you right now, but I'm not going to do that. He, he, he saw her across the room, their eyes met, his knees went a little weak. His heart started melting like a Hershey bar on a hot summer day. You had that experience, right? Yeah, he's saying right, yeah. And he fell in love, and after a two-year courtship, they were married in the rectory of St. Patrick's Cathedral up in New York City, May 25th, 1898. They were married in the rectory because Catherine was Roman Catholic and Milton was a Protestant. Nevertheless, Milton and Kitty, as he called her, that was a family name. All of her friends and family called her Kitty. That's how we'll refer to her. What was Bill Hershey's wife's name? Kitty. They had a happy marriage, but there was one sad thing for the couple. Doctors discovered early in their marriage that Kitty suffered from a severe nervous disorder. They told her it was unlikely that she'd ever be able to have any children. 
Well, she eventually suggested to Milton, since they couldn't have any children of their own, so they start a home with a school for boys who had no parents of their own, and that's what they did. In 1909, they signed a deed of trust that established what at that time was called the Hershey Industrial School. Then the following year, 1910, the first four boys moved into the Hershey homestead, Mr. Hershey's birthplace. They moved in there with their house parents, George and Prudence Copenhaver, and the Copenhavers would be their teachers as well as their family. That right there was the humble beginning for what today is the world's largest privately endowed pre-kindergarten to grade 12 home and school for boys and girls from families of low income and social needs. All those buildings we talked about found this hall right here, built in the late 1960s. It was dedicated on September 13, 1970. That was the anniversary of Mr. Hershey's birth. Now, the, 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 uh, the building's built out of limestone on the outside, but when you walk into the rotunda, the round part of the building, when you walk in there, it's 120 feet across. It's 74 feet from the floor up to the ceiling. And when you're standing in the center of the rotunda in there, you're surrounded by 1,550 tons of Vermont gray marble. It's beautiful. It's an additional 63 feet on the outside of the building. Total height's 137 feet. And that dome over top of it, when the building was dedicated in 1970, that dome, because the rotunda's 120 feet across, it made that dome the largest unsupported dome in the Western Hemisphere. Second largest dome of its kind in the world at that time. Only the dome over St. Peter's Basilica in Rome would have been larger. And that's in the Vatican. And this was out in the middle of a bunch of cornfields. In the middle of nowhere. This building is being refurbished right now. There's a visitor center in here. We anticipate it will open in about a year and a half. Next time you're here, you come back and visit, see if it's open. The docents here, they're alumnus of the school, spouses of alumnus, former staff, eager for folks like you to come and visit them and, and see how beautiful the building is, but also to learn firsthand what it's like to be a student here, what the school's done for the boys and girls over the years, and they won't charge you anything. Why, they won't ask you for any money. Why would they? Because when you leave, you'll be their ambassador. When you go home, perhaps you'll know a family whose child will benefit from coming to the school. A lot of the children that come to the school here come here by word of mouth. Thanks for waiting for me, George. Now, when the school started, Mr. Hershey had three main goals for the boys, all relating to his upbringing. So think back to what I told you about his early childhood. You remember how many places he lived growing up? 17. 17. You remember how many schools he went to? Seven. Seven. He wanted the boys to get a, get, get a good education, and they did. But just as importantly, he wanted them to have a sense of stability and security. So they didn't live in a big dormitory. They lived in a house with a married couple to take care of them. That's what the school still does. I'll tell you more about that later. He also wanted the boys to learn a trade, just like he learned a trade early on. His boys learned the building trades, mechanical Hi. trades. Starting in 1929, the boys began to learn how to work around the farm. And for the next 60 years, the boys, and later the girls too, they participated in what was called the farm home program, doing chores around the farm, milking cows, working in the fields. They were learning a work ethic and responsibility, and they were living the lifestyle of any South Central Pennsylvania farm kid. 1951, they changed the name of the school. They changed it from the Hershey Industrial School to the Milton Hershey School, and that's the name for all of you to remember today. Milton Hershey School. What's the name of the school today? Milton Hershey School. And with that name change, they shifted focus more towards academics. Today, the school is more of a college preparatory school. Most graduating classes, over 90% of the kids will go off to some form of higher education. But still, when they enter high school or ninth grade, they're required to choose one of 11 career paths and get the equivalent of a two-year certificate in that career path as part of the graduation requirements along with business and financial management and accounting, computer technology, journalism and law, and electronic media. Those are the fancy ones. They can still choose agriculture. And over there, that's a classroom on our right. The fields out there, the orchards up on the hill, down Meadow Lane, there's some greenhouses. Kids in that program come over there, learn how to plant, cultivate crops. They have a student market where they learn to market their produce. Here's the oldest building on campus. It's called Kinder House. 1816 farmhouse, Milton Hershey acquired it, it became an early student home. Today it's the school's archive. And the fields beyond it, those are all homes for 9th graders through 11th graders. The 12th graders live in these big brick homes coming up on our right. 
These are transitional living homes for the high school seniors. They're like apartment buildings. They're, there's a transitional living homes for boys and, and ones for girls. They live there with the resident assistant, keep an eye on them, and help them to learn how to budget. Because the high school seniors are given an allowance for their money each month. And they have to do their own shopping, pay their own bills, get up in the morning, get to the day's activities, and make their own meals. They spend their last year here getting ready to head off to college and to the workforce. Here's the Hershey Homestead, Mill Hershey's birthplace, that big gray house over here. It's huge, isn't it? Because that wasn't what it looked like in 1826. Look at the patio furniture in front of these stairs here that go up to the back porch, right there. That center section of the house is built out of field limestone. This is Mel Hershey's great-grandfather, Isaac Hershey, built that in 1826. Milton Hershey was born in that part of the house on September 13th, 1857. His cradle's still in the room he was born in. Now, the house was sold in 1877. He reacquired the house in 1897. By then, the wooden wings had been added on each side of the stone farm house. He and Kitty lived there until 1908. Then, then it became, in 1910, the first student home for the boys at the industrial school. Today, it's the residence for the presidents of the Milton Hershey School. And they added on a garage and a breezeway. They put this black fence around it, landscaped all around it. They really fancied it up. A lot of that landscaping is to make it more private because the, high, uh, the, the president of the school, he entertains the kids a lot over here. That patio furniture and everything. So they'll have picnics and things out here. They don't want the kids to feel like they're being put on display. So that gives them, a, that gives them privacy. But the other thing about the homestead right here, besides Mr. Hershey being born here, this is also the birthplace of Hershey's milk chocolate. Because when Mr. Hershey bought this house back in 1897, out here behind these, these homes right here in this field, there was an old barn sitting out there. He had that barn demolished, and in its place he had constructed a brand new modern milk house with a laboratory attached to it. He started working in that laboratory on the process and recipe for milk chocolate. Now, milk chocolate was little known in this country in the 1890s. It was being made over in Europe by companies like Lind and Nestle, one little batch at a time, and it was a pretty expensive luxury over there. He wanted to apply mass production to make milk chocolate, make it affordable to everybody. He had a pretty good idea about how to do it, but there were some processes he had to work out, basically by trial and error. Worked in that milk house for two years with some of his trusted workers, 20 hour days. So finally in 1899, say that date with me everyone, 1899, one more time, real loud. 1899! He introduced the world to the very first mass produced affordable milk chocolate, and he introduced that milk chocolate with a five cent chocolate bar from his factory down in Lancaster, and they called that chocolate bar a Hershey bar. It was instantaneously popular. It was so popular, the following year, 1900, he said, caramels are a fad, my future lies in chocolate. He sold the Lancaster Caramel Company that year for $1 million. Took that million dollars, came up here to Dairy Church where he was born. Started buying up cornfields, started building his chocolate factory in his town. And as we go around town and, you, and you're looking at the sites, keep in mind what you're seeing as a result of the continued popularity of his chocolate his business acumen, but particularly his concern for the people in his community, and especially his concern for the boys here at the school. You see, Milton and Kitty never did have any children of their own. They said, these boys will be our boys whether we happen to be their parents or not. And those boys looked on them as family, and those boys were Milton and Kitty's heirs. And the homes we're passing by right now on either side of this trolley, these are the homes of the modern-day heirs of Milton and Kitty Hershey. The way these houses work, eight to 12 kids live in each house. The homes are age-based and gender-based. So there's homes for boys, homes for girls. They live in a house close to the school they attend, and they live there with a married couple whose full-time job is to love, nurture, and support these children. House parents here, though, they say it's more than a job to them. It's a lifestyle, a life choice. Now, when the school started, it was for boys whose fathers had died. Later, they changed the trust of the one or both parents would have died. In 1977, the first girls came to the school. And about that time, they did away with the requirement that a child had to be an orphan. They recognized by then that there were a lot of children out there who were essentially social orphans. So these days, in order to come to the school, a child can be a boy or a girl. They may have one or both parents, but they have to be from a family struggling financially. They have to be a U.S. citizen, have average health, average intelligence. They may not have been in trouble with the law. If they meet all of those requirements, they can apply to the admissions office, they'll go through a formal interview process, and if they're accepted, they can come to the school anytime between their fourth, fourth birthday 
and their 14th, I'm sorry, got that in my head. Anytime between their fourth birthday and their 16th birthday. And once the kids are here, they're here as long as they obey the rules and as long as they want to stay and the school does everything they can to help the kids make it by their housing, their clothing, their food, their education, medical, dental and vision care, tutoring, counseling. The kids even get an allowance of the savings account in their own name. None of that will cost the child or the family anything. Won't cost us anything. No tax money comes to school. All funded through the trust Milton and Kitty set up back in 1909. Mr. Hershey said he didn't want anything back from his boys but he did encourage them in the course of their lives to help other people the way the school would help them. Brings me to his third goal for his boys. He wanted them to receive religious instruction. The Hershey family were Mennonites. His mother Fanny was a devout Mennonite lady. One of his favorite uncles was a pastor in that church. Mr. Hershey himself never joined the Mennonite church, but when he was asked about his faith, he said, I believe in the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. And I believe if my boys live by those principles, I'll see them someday in paradise. So when the boys enrolled, they'd all get a Bible. They were expected to memorize those passages on Sundays to go to church services. The school still honors that. The Ten Commandments are displayed in all of the student homes. The children will have devotions in the morning. And on Sunday mornings, 2,100 children are, are transported to, to attend a uh, one-hour non-denominational chapel service. Boys dressed up in suits and ties, girls in dresses or pantsuits. You're either at that service or you're in the infirmary. And after that service is over then, the school will transport the kids to any church in the vicinity that they would choose to attend. In Mr. Hershey's day, when the boys graduated from the school, they'd be here with a hands-on skill with which they could support themselves. They'd get a new wardrobe, a set of luggage to carry that in, brand new crisp hundred dollar bill, a handshake, slap on the back, he'd say, go get a tiger. They get all of that today as a tradition, but they get a laptop computer to go along with it because the majority of the kids, they're going to head off to college or technical school when they graduate. Now the boys and girls, once they start their time at the Milton Hershey School, they're evaluated three ways. By their grades, they have to maintain a C average. By their effort, they have to show that they're putting forth a good effort in their studies. And wherever they're at, by their conduct. And depending on that evaluation, the children can earn up to $90,000 to help them with the cost of their post-secondary education. People would tell Mr. Hershey, this is wonderful what you're doing here, Milton. This was a great idea. He'd say, it was a good idea, but it wasn't my idea. Whose idea was it, everybody? Kitty's idea. Good job. Right now, we're heading over to the house that Milton Hershey built for Kitty. On our way there, we're going to be skirt skirting the west course of the Hershey Country Club right here on either side of us. But look out here to the left. Look down at the far end of the fairway. That's the old chocolate factory down there, the site of the old factory. The creek that flows through the golf course here, that's called the Spring Creek. It's a spring-fed creek. It was the original freshwater source for the chocolate factory down there. So they started making chocolate at the factory in 1905. Mr. Hershey said, now, finally, I can concentrate on building Kitty an appropriate home. Up till this time, they've been living at the, at the homestead. Her house was finished in 1908, up on top of the hill here to our right. We're going to go up and take a look at it. When the house was finished, Kitty Hershey said, Milton, I love this house, but we need some flowers in our front yard. Well, their front yard was everything from up on top of the hill here, all the way out to Chocolate Avenue, and all the way down here to where the factory started. So, uh, so Mr. Hershey hired some gardeners, built a greenhouse, by half a railroad car full of rhododendron, imported these chocolate geese from Oompa Loompa Land. See them out here, they're chocolate geese. They're all, they're all over the place. They got dark chocolate heads, milk chocolate bodies, white chocolate bellies. They don't fly any for themselves, they don't. You can take home all that you want with you. Just don't bite them, they bite back. Flower garden paths out here, benches, fountains out in the creek and the pond that used to be over here on the right. By 1912, people were welcome to come here, ride the trolley here on this lane we just came in on, it's an old trolley lane. And uh, they were welcome to get off of their picnic baskets and stroll and picnic in what they called Kitty's Gardens. We call it the front yard of the High Point Mansion. High Point Mansion, the home built Hershey built for Kitty, is up on top of the hill there to the right front of the trolley. We're going to go up there and take a closer look at it. On the way there, a real fast look over to the left. On that ridge over there, you'll see a limestone church through the trees. That's the modern-day Derry Presbyterian Church, the old, the old church that the Scots-Irish built back in the, seventh, in the uh, 17, 
uh, 20s, it's long gone. But uh, that ridge over there is where that little villa that Dairy Church sprang up, around the church where we got our name for Dairy Township. Lots of history. If you like history and scrolling through old graveyards and old buildings, that's that's a good place for you because it's on East Dairy Road. But we're not going to talk much more about it. I want to tell you about High Point. High Point Mansion over here to the right is a 22-room colonial revival style home. It's built out of limestone that was quarried right here on site. Built between 1906 and 1908. When it was finished, Mr. Hershey sat down and wrote out a check for $53,433 for his 22-room limestone home. All those flowers of kitties that I was telling you about. By 1910, he'd written out an additional $40,000 worth of checks for all of those. Mr. Hershey built Kitty a $53,000 mansion with a $40,000 bouquet out in front of him. You think he loved Kitty just a little bit? However, they only lived here together for just about 70 years. Remember I told you Kitty had a severe nervous disorder. She never got better. She became progressively weaker. By 1915, Kitty Hershey was practically an invalid. In March of 1915, she developed pneumonia. And on the 25th of March, 1915, at the age of 43 years old, Kitty Hershey passed away. Mr. Hershey was unprepared for that news. He was devastated. He said, I've lost the love of my life. I'll never get married again. And he never did. And as far as this mansion went then, he would say, you know, they call this High Point Mansion because it's up on this hill. But for me, the high point of my life is to living here with Kitty. And I can't live there without it. There's too many memories. So he pulled the blinds, he locked the doors, and he left the mansion. And he didn't return for 15 years. Later I'll tell you where he went to, but when he did return, this multi-millionaire moved into a two-room apartment on the far side of the balcony up there on the second floor. And those two rooms were his lodgings until he passed away on October 13, 1945. He died exactly one month after his 88th birthday. This like Kitty liked flowers, and Mr. Hershey loved golf. So he had a golf course behind the house. When he moved back here in 1930, he gave the golf course and the use of the first floor of the mansion to the town, and they used the first floor as their clubhouse. So he wasn't in there all by himself. There was activity going on here. After he died, they used the mansion as a clubhouse until 1971 when they moved into a new one. Then the house was restored, converted into offices. The executives for Hershey Company moved in there until 1991. When they moved out into their new headquarters, at that point, the people that take care of the money from Milton and Kitty's kids, the boys and girls at the Milton Hershey School, the Hershey Trust Company, they moved their offices into the mansion. That's who's in there today. The only people that ever lived there was Milton and Kitty, other than a caretaker who over here. So they work in there. It's closed to the public. They don't give tours, unfortunately. The golf course is the Hershey Country Club. And it's a private club, so this lane here is close to the public. We have a contract to bring our guests up here to the mansion so they can see the mansion and we can tell this part of the story. Please don't drive up on your own. They don't appreciate that. If you have an appointment with the trust, that would be fine. But if you drive up with them without an appointment, well, you know what they call that, don't you? Trust passing. It's a big house. Look at it as George drives by. I, I think he did pretty well for $53,000, don't you? Look over here to the, to the left front of the car. You see that limestone building down there in the hollow? That's, a, that's the Terry Church School. It was built in 1844. It's a little one-room schoolhouse. Milton Hershey went to second grade there in 1863. He grew up in this area. He wanted to live in this town where he grew up. He, he could have lived any place he chose to. But he was a hands-on owner. He wanted to be close to his factory, keep his hands in the business, walk out the front door, be at work. He wanted the same thing for his top executives. So he made these fellows an offer. He says, gentlemen, I'll sell you the land for one dollar. And with my construction company, I'll build you any style house you like. So I'm going to show you three little one dollar shanties here in just a few moments. There was a stipulation, though, that when they retired or left the business, that they would sell the house back to the trust. Didn't come back for a dollar though, came back at market value. One of the houses was for his friend William Franklin Reynolds Murray. William Murray was a confectionery salesman for a, a, a company out of Pittsburgh in the middle of the 1890s. The saying is, or the, the story goes that he met Milton Hershey in a billiard parlor in Lancaster. 
And uh, William Neary made a bet with Mr. Hershey. He said, he said, I bet I can sell all the chocolate you can make in that factory across the street in a year's time. Mr. Hershey thought that was a pretty good bet. He took them off on it. Pretty soon became apparent that he was going to lose it. He said to Mr. Neary, he said, if you're that good of a salesman, I'm making you the general manager of my chocolate factory. Later on, William Neary became the president of the company. Ran the company for over 40 years. On our way there, now that house was the house of the gardener. Mr. Hershey didn't like the stonework on that house, so he gave it to his gardener. This next house was the house he built for his personal attorney, John Snyder. That was a gift from Milton Hershey to John Snyder in 1910. For his hard work, wise counsel, and his friendship. But these next three houses, these were these one dollar houses. First treasurer of the company lived in that stone and frame house right there behind the trees there. William Murray, the first president, lived in that white house with the gray trim. And then, and then James Lighthizer, an early board member on the Hershey Trust, he lived in that brick home. All came back into the trust at market value. They've been divided up into apartments. On our right are our famous Hershey cocoa bushes. Planted in 1909, right at the edge of Kitty's Gardens. They're cocoa bushes because they spell Hershey cocoa. They're actually barberry bushes. Now look at this black fence right here. This marks the perimeter of the original chocolate factory. Look at that black fence. Visualize a wall three to five stories high and the building gone all the way back towards those yellow silos. That was the that plus the rest of the factory that's still there. That was the original size of the factory. Two thirds of the chocolate factory by the spring of 2012, the foundation is in very poor condition. So two thirds of it's gone. What remains? They refurbished, restored the foundation, refurbished it inside, and uh, today it's office of the Hershey Company. But when this company, when this factory was in the peak of production. They could make 33 million Hershey kisses every day. They could wrap 1,500 chocolate bars in a minute, and it would take the milk from 50,000 dairy cows for just one day of chocolate making. That's that. Town's first hospital was over here at the community building. We sort of passed it. It's on the. It's over your left shoulder there. It was up on the fifth floor. Town's first bank's on our right. Hershey Trust Bank, founded in 1905. This building was built in 1915. Designed by the same man that, that designed the, the uh, High Point Mansion and the community building, C.M. Urban out of, out of Lancaster. Look at the tip to the right here and look to that uh, limestone portion of the old chocolate factory. That part of the factory was built in 1935. And when it was built, it didn't have any windows in it. The people in town called it the windowless office building, one of the first industrial buildings in the country to have air conditioning. As we cross the bridge, we're going into the fun part of town. On our right is Zoo America North American Wildlife Park. It features 200 North American animals on 11 acres. It started out in 1910 as the Hershey Park Zoo, and Milton Hershey gave his private wildlife collection to the town, and it became the foundation for the zoo. Hershey Park, that's over here to the left. Anybody been to Hershey Park? Did you know that Hershey Park started out just as a picnic grove? In 1907, it started out as a place where the people in town could go boating, fishing, and picnicking along the Spring Creek right there. Then in 1912, Mr. Hershey added a carousel to the park. 1923, they added a wooden roller coaster. They called it the Joy Ride. Later, they changed the name to the Wild Cat. Hershey Park took off from there. Today, Hershey Park sits on 121 acres. There's over 67 rides and attractions. 14 of them are roller coasters. On our right, Across the street right there, that's the one, the original Hershey bar. Hershey bar. That's a good bar. It's a good bar, isn't it? Full of nuts. Yeah, full of nuts. People go there on payday. Or just to take five. Yeah, 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 right. This, our, this section of Hershey Park right here is called Midway America. The rides are designed to represent the early amusement parks in the country, so the roller coasters, they're not that old. This one here is called Lightning Racer, America's largest wooden building roller coaster, built in the, uh, the, the early 2000s. On the far side is the new Wildcat, the Ferris wheels here, and then the newest one of our newest roller coasters is inside a fun house, the white building with the colorful murals on it. That's, that's our newest fun house. It, it's, it's the fourth fun house that Hershey Park has had over the years. Out ahead of us here, as we cross uh, Hershey Park Drive and go up the hill, you're going to see a big red brick building up on top of the hill. That's the main offices for the Hershey Company. The Hershey Company today is a global company. There's, there's sales offices for manufacturing in, in, uh, in 60 countries around the world. There's factories, factories in 14 countries. Uh, there's 14 factories around the world. Eight of them are in the United States. One of them is in Canada. 
two down in Mexico, one in uh, India, one in Malaysia, and one in Greater China. Does that make 13? I mean 14, I think it does. So uh, 24,000 Hershey employees worldwide. But Hershey here is the world's main headquarters. And ladies up here at the at the main office complex, that's where the offices are for Michelle Buck. Since December of 2016, Michelle Buck is the 12th president and CEO of the Hershey Company. She's the first woman to hold that position and only the 27th woman to be at the helm of a Fortune 500 company. A year after um, Kitty Hershey's death, Mr. Hershey was still in mourning. And his mother Fanny observed that. She said, Milton, you need to get away from town and forget about business for a while. So he took her and some of her friends and they went off on vacation. Went down to New Orleans, but then a cold snap came through and they and they and so they went a little further south to Cuba. And he liked it there. He liked Cuba. He liked the climate. He liked the people. But what he liked best of all was he looked around, he saw thousands of acres of sugar cane. And he got to thinking about all the years he went out of business because of the high cost of sugar. So he started buying up sugar cane fields. Not only that, the, the, the First World War was going on, and a lot of his sugar was coming from European sugar beet fields. So he started buying up sugar cane fields in, in, in uh, Cuba. Eventually, he would own 65,000 acres of sugar cane. He would lease thousands and thousands of acres more. He would uh, have five sugar refineries, and in his lifetime, he would become one of the world's largest manufacturers of sugar. Now most of it, you could buy Hershey Sugar uh, retail, but most of it was sold wholesale to companies like Hershey Chocolate Company, little beverage company out of Atlanta, Georgia. What company would that be? Coca-Cola. Well, he looked around at the living conditions of his Cuban workers, and he was appalled. He said, we owe it to these folks to provide them with nicer homes than they have now. So he put in the infrastructure so his Cuban workers would have homes with inside plumbing, running water, electricity, and then he built them homes that they could made available for them at a cost they could afford. He built educational, recreational, and cultural facilities for the community. After a train accident, he built an orphanage. The whole thing was so much like Hershey back here, they called it Central Hershey, Cuba. Well, he divided his time between Cuba and here in town up until 1930 when he moved back into the mansion. And he was reading the newspaper one day and he was reading about community or communities in our country where people were standing in soup lines, bread lines, they were living in tent cities. He said, we can't have that kind of stuff and come to Hershey. We're taking the profits from the sugar business. We're going to go on a building campaign and make work for people. His top executive said, hold on, Mr. Hershey. We might need that, that money to weather this financial crisis. Mr. Hershey said, gentlemen, that's not the way I operate. So 19, between 1929 and 1932, they built that big community center downtown. In 1933, up on top of the hill to our right, they built the Hotel Hershey. At that time, 171 room, four diamond luxury hotel. In 1937, to our left, they set aside four and a half acres here, and they dedicated a four and a half acre rose garden in memory of his wife, Kitty. All those plantings, you wonder where all the flowers went to down by the mansion. A lot of them got moved up here in this wow. right over here. Some of her roses still bloom over here in what today is Hershey Garden. 23 acres, if you want to get an idea as to what the front yard of High Point Mansion looked like when Kitty was alive, come over here and take a stroll. On the hill in front of us here, the hill that says Welcome to Hershey, in 1934 they built a great big castle on this hill. They called it Senior Hall, a junior senior high school for the boys at the Hershey Industrial School. In 1935 they built that addition to the chocolate factory, the windowless office building. 1936, down at the bottom of the hill on the far side of the parking lot, there's a big tan yellow half barrel down there. That's the Hershey Park Arena, an ice hockey rink. When that was built in 1936, it had the country's largest monolithic concrete roof. And right beside it is a football field and grandstands. That's Hershey Park Stadium, built in 1939. Seven major building projects here in Hershey during the Great Depression. And throughout the Great Depression, nobody in Hershey lost their job but one or one or took a pay cut. In fact, employment in Hershey nearly doubled from all of the folks who were coming here looking for work. A newspaper writer came here to town during that time, and he came here, looked around, and he went home and he wrote, in Hershey, Pennsylvania, time has stood still, and the effects of the Depression are nowhere to be seen. Today we call it the Great Building Campaign. A lot of families credit Milton Hershey with keeping the families together during those times. A lot of families got their starts when, when parents, grandparents came here and met 
and they began their law lives together. Well, uh, you, you can go on. You want to go up there? Oh, you? You should be able to, be, be able to go on. I tried it. I tried it in that lane. This, this right lane, and it still worked. Because I was wondering if it would do the same, the one on the same thing. Does it would work or not? And it did. You don't have to be right up against that thing. We're talking about automation on the trolley. Now you're going to quickly discover that the best view of town is from up on top of this hill. You can see all over. Hershey Park Arena down there, that's an ice hockey rink. It was the original home for our, our, our amateur hockey team here in town, the Hershey Bars. Bill Hershey named his hockey team himself. They just, uh, just he wore silk. Did I already tell you guys this? I, I can, sometimes I can't remember what I told one, one group of people the next, but that his, his hockey team wore a silver and maroon uniform. That was the color for the wrapper for Hershey Bars. And, and their, their jersey had a big bear's head on it. And over top of the, jer the bear's head was the word Hershey, and underneath was spelled B apostrophe A R S. He named his hockey team the Hershey Bars. 1938, they went to the American Hockey League to join that league. They're professional. They said, What's that on your jersey? They said, We're the Bars. They said, No, you're not. You can't call yourself that. That's too commercial. So they changed the name to the Bears, and they've been playing here ever since. It's the Hershey Bears. They're on their 85th, 81st season in the, in the American Hockey League. This was uh, Catherine Hall. We just passed this building right here. That's the middle school for the 5th through 8th graders. And those kids that go to school here, they live over on that next ridge. See the big houses on the side of the hill over there? Those are the middle school homes. They cost about $2.5 million a piece to build. And uh, that's where they've been working on building 30 more homes by the year 2020. So that at that point, they can be up to 2,300 underserved children here on campus. We're gonna retrace our steps real fast like. If you look over your right shoulder down across the hill, you can see the Giant Center, that long building with the long white roof. That's the, opened in 2002, the modern home of the Hershey Bears hockey team. Over top of the roof of the Giant Center, you can see the West Hershey Chocolate Factory, the big white building with the white building spread out from its base world's largest, most technologically advanced chocolate factory. There's a hill behind the factory. If you follow along the face of that hill to the left, you come to a group of buildings with lots of windows in them. That's the Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center, Penn State University's College of Medicine, and the township's largest employer. Components of the medical center line that ridge over there about a mile up and down the ridge. All together, they employ 10,000 people. Medicine is the township's largest employer. Candy making takes a back seat to that. From this direction, directly towards us from the medical center, and amongst the trees there on the left, you see a yellow, a yellow tan building there, a long building with a tower on the front, and what looks like two black eyes looking at you over top of the trees. That's the Reese factory. We're making all those Tina butter cups. Immediately at the base of the hill is Chocolate World. Chocolate World has the trapezoidal roof on top. We're heading back there right now. Hershey Park Stadium. That's where they play high school sports in the wintertime. That's where we have summer concert series in the summertime. From 1951 to 1967, Hershey was the tr summer training camp for the Philadelphia Eagles, and they practiced down there in the stadium. At that time, the stadium was also the town's tornado shelter. Everybody would go over there to see the shelter whenever there was a tornado warning, realizing as long as the Eagles were playing down there, there was very little chance of a touchdown. <laughs> Sorry, Eagles fan. That's just a joke. Behind it is a, is a marina. Hershey Park Arena, uh, ice hockey rink, but also NBA basketball games. And on March 2nd, 1962, there was a ba basketball game down there between the Philadelphia Warriors and the New York Knickerbockers. In that game, one of the Warriors, by halftime, he had scored 40 points, and his teammates said, let's keep, let's keep feeding Wilt the ball and see how many points he can score. By the end of the game, he'd scored 100 points. That's still an NBA individual game record. Happened down here at the arena. Big tower sticking up in the air with a flag on top of it. It's called the Kissing Tower. To the left of it, behind it, it that red tower roof is the old is the uh, community building. To the left of that, in the distance, you can see Founders Hall. It's, it's going to go out of sight pretty soon. To the left of that is uh, those yellow silos. Those yellow silos are cocoa beet silos. There's 24 of them, and all combined, they can hold 90 million pounds of cocoa beans. That was enough cocoa beans to make chocolate for nine months. And then those smokestacks that say Hershey on them, 
you're part of the town's old power plant. That power plant provided electricity for the chocolate factory, for Milton Hershey's community, and for the trolleys that operated here in town from 1904 to 1946, Hershey was a trolley town. Anybody have any questions? Whew. I'm going to take a break. I'd go along with him. And we would go to the grocery store and we'd come to the candy aisle. And uh, when we got there, I would point to the top of the aisle. Oh, I seemed to be on the top shelf, way out of my reach, was this box about that about that big square, about that thick, two layers of, of, uh, of Reese's peanut butter cups. And I'd say, Dad, I was really good this week. Can I have a, can you get a box of peanut butter cups? Come on, Dad. Let's, and, and sometimes if he thought I was good, he'd get a box of those. Only trouble was he'd eat half of them. Uh, but, but, and he'd, but he'd share some with me. Uh, but, oh man, I love peanut butter cups. Harry Reese and, and Mr. Hershey were good friends. And uh, Harry Reese took the idea to, uh, for peanut butter cups from Mr. Hershey on, on a number of occasions. And each time Mr. Hershey said, he kept putting them off. But finally on the third time, Mr. Hershey said to Harry, he said, listen Harry, it's a good candy, I'll give you that. But I got a lot on my plate right now. I'm working on onion flavored ice cream. What? Yeah, and he said, once I got that licked, I'm going to try my hand at cocoa butter soap. But look, you're doing a good job with that. You make it, and I'll help you. Well, he was due to his work. Sent some of his engineers down to Harry's factory, helped him come up with better processes for making peanut butter cups. When money was tight, Milton Hershey would sell Harry chocolate at cost and on credit. By the time Harry Reese died in 1956, his company was Hershey's number two customer for bulk chocolate. His, his uh, family ran the business till 1963. At that point, they were ready to retire. So in 1963, they sold their business to the Hershey Company for $23 million. And for $23 million, Hershey got its number one selling best love candy, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. <laughs> so one last treat for you as you get off the trolley today. But before I do that, I need to tell you one other thing. Remember, Milt Hershey never had any siblings that survived, right? And he didn't have, he and Kitty never had any children. So three years after Kitty's death, he got to think of what would happen to the boys at the school if I were to die unexpectedly the way Kitty did. So in 1918, he quietly went up to New York City and signed over the bulk of his wealth. That included all of his stock in his chocolate company, which that alone by 1918 was valued at $60 million. All of that went into the trust, and the only thing the trust could ever do with that money is to support the school in perpetuity and honor of Kitty. Trust today gets its money by only the controlling interest of the voting shares of the Hershey Company. 82 to 84% of the voting stock is in the trust, but all of the stock of the other Hershey entities, they own all of the stock of that. Major one being Hershey Entertainment Resorts, Hershey, Hershey, uh, uh, Hershey Park, Hershey Park Stadium, Hershey Park Arena, Zoo America, Hershey Bears Hockey Team, all the Hershey branded lodgings. Anytime folks come up here to Hershey to have fun, stay at any of Hershey's locations or eat Hershey's products, any place in the world, a portion of those profits come back to the trust to help take care of the kids at the school. The trust today is conservatively valued at $12 billion. And the reason they don't want you to go up to the mansion, all the money, all that money is kept in the closets and stashed in the halls. So please don't go up there. Now, one last treat. It's a Hershey's Chocolate History Diploma. Suitable for framing. Uh, so you can take this home, put it in a frame, hang it on your wall. Now, 
I just don't give these out. You have to pass a quiz. I figured you've been all on the trolley all the time. You must have learned something. So it's only five questions. It's an oral quiz and it's a group exercise. So let's see how you do. What was Mr. Hershey's first candy making success? Carl. What was his wife's name? Jane. What year did he introduce the Hershey bar from his back in Lancaster? 1899. Good job. What's the name of the school today for the children for families in financial needs? Milton Hershey. What was it? Milton Hershey. Milton Hershey School. You're right, you're getting there. And whose idea was that school? Kitty. Kitty's idea. Good job, everybody. Right here is a diploma right here. I call it a diploma because on the back of it there's a seal. Like that, you know, diplomas have a seal on them, right? This is this particular seal is a thank you from the boys and girls up the Milton Hershey School for buying Hershey products and supporting the school. There's a web address on there too that you can go to to learn more. MHSKids.org. Well, here we are back at Taco Bell. Motor Man George and I thank all of you for coming along with us today. And we we hope the rest of your time here in town is sweet. Have safe travels. Just stay in your seats until uh, we come to a complete stop. We gotta get across the crosswalk here and uh, come in for a four point landing. So, uh, oh, by the way, what what has four wheels, a horn, and flies? The garbage truck. Hey, we've had a lot of.